Hello and welcome to Nilda Live. My guest today is Lenore Skenazy. Lenore, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much for even getting the name right, Nelda. Thanks. <laughs> we had to work at those, right? <laughs> it rhymes with crazy. Very easy. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Well, Lenore, the way I came to know you was through an article about your son riding the subway. Could you please tell our audience about that experience and what happened there? Sure. It's been a while now, um, but years ago when our younger son was nine years old, he started asking me and my husband if we would take him someplace he'd never been before in our hometown, New York City, and let him find his own way home via public transit, via the subway. And uh, my husband and I discussed this and uh, we decided, sure, we thought he was ready. He's, we're always on the subway. That's how we get around the city. And so one sunny Sunday, I took him to Bloomingdale's fancy schmancy store where he hadn't been before. And I left him there telling him that that was the day. It wasn't like, you know, he was suddenly abandoned or lost or something. And uh, I went home a different way. And he, sure enough, he went down into the subway. He took it down to 34th Street, which you've probably heard of from Miracle on 34th Street. It's the Macy's Street. And then he took a bus across town to get to our apartment complex. And when he came through the door, he was floating. He was levitating. He was so proud of himself. And I think grateful that we had recognized that he was ready to do something grown up like that. You know, kids want to be big. And we'd said, okay. And so I was a newspaper columnist at the time, back when there were more newspapers and more columnists. And so I wrote why I let my nine-year-old ride the subway alone. And two days later, I was on the Today Show, MSNBC, Fox News, and NPR. Fox News and NPR, at, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's a spectrum, uh, and uh, defending myself. And I got the nickname America's Worst Mom from having done that. And I, um, you know, I was disheartened, <laughs> to say the least, and somewhat shocked by all the things that were being said about me and what a terrible mom I was. So I started um, a blog that I called Free Range Kids that said, you know, our kids are smarter and safer than the culture gives them credit for, and that morphed into the uh, nonprofit Let Grow, which I had now. So obviously, it was not the intent that you expected to happen when you wrote your article. What, I mean, really and truly, what were your expectations when you wrote it, that how people's reaction to it? Uh, always hard to remember because the nine-year-old is 22. Um, <laughs> but uh, when I went back and looked at my, not only that article, but some articles I'd written beforehand that didn't get a whole lot of response. Nothing I've ever written has gotten this much response, let's be clear. Um, I wrote an article once about when my kids were like four and six, and I would take them to the children's theater. It, there's the new Victory Theater. You, you probably know this. You're a Broadway producer um, in Times Square uh, that's owned by Disney. I think it's owned by Disney. And I would let them go into the boys' room, you know, the men's room by themselves. And I know that some of the other moms thought, oh, my God, they're, they're just four and six. And I was like, yeah, there's a million kids there. There's a million parents. I, I, I felt totally safe doing that. And I didn't understand why this would be considered bad parenting if I trusted my kids and I trusted the environment. So I'd written a column about that earlier. I'd written a column about letting my kids play in the courtyard of the aforementioned giant um, buildings that we lived in in Manhattan. Um, there's no cars there's guards. It just felt like fine to let them go down and play by themselves when they were seven, eight, nine. So um, I'd been writing about, I, you know, I felt a little out of step with some of society in that I would let my kids do things maybe a little sooner than some of the other moms, but not because I was um, devil may care or didn't care about safety. It's just because I, I think because I was a reporter and I was tuned into the um, reality as opposed to the fear that had been seeping into our culture for about a generation or two. So I actually, I don't remember what the question was I was started <laughs> this one out with, but uh, whatever it was, I was shocked by the response to this column, considering I've been writing columns for 10 years and nobody cared what I wrote. But I know you, you also have, have stayed um, a, a, in this area. You, let's let's just kind of transition and talk about helicopter parenting because i know that is kind of where the trend has gone and so could you describe helicopter parenting to us i can um but uh with the caveat beforehand that people think that i'm the anti-helicopter mom um and i i, I actually am part helicopter on my mother's side i mean i'm not a an unnervous parent so i i totally believe in um prudent safety you know self seat belts um, helmets when you're riding a bike, uh, mouth guards when you're playing a game. In fact, when my kid was 10 years old and we had a 
football party for him. And that was the gift I gave all the kids. Woohoo, really fun. <laughs> uh, the mom, no, like no candy, you're getting a mouth guard. <laughs> um, but the, the, the helicopter parenting term refers to the idea of like a helicopter. What does it do? It stays in one place and it can um, look down on one thing uh, for as long as it wants. And it's generally there because something bad is going on or they want to prevent something from going on. So the idea was that somewhere along the line, um, parents went from pretty much trusting their kids to be okay, let them out of their sight, you know, uh, come home when the street lights come on, to thinking that whenever kids aren't supervised, something bad might be happening. And there were sort of two parallel fears that grew at the same time. One is kidnapping, the man in the white van. That just, that was not a huge fear when I was growing up. I, I don't know about you, Nelda. Was it a huge fear when you were growing up? I recall I moved to Texas when I was in second grade. So I know for certain that prior to probably around kindergarten, I know that in kindergarten, I was going up and down the street visiting friends and they were coming over to my house. And I know that I was bike riding down into a field and we had a bike route that was that we had made, right? That was all throughout this field and the kids had a great time. And yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, my childhood was um, in the suburbs of Chicago. But once again, it was similar. When I was five, I was walking to school, to kindergarten. And then when I got to the corner that I had to pass, there was a crossing guard who was also a kid. Do you remember that? <laughs> when they, you remember, like there used to be kids were trusted with other kids as opposed to, gosh, in my neighborhood, I, 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 you know, of course I'm in New York City now, but there's still, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not Manhattan. I'm in Queens. It's a much more neighborhoody neighborhood. And when the crossing guard, who's an adult, is not available, they, they, they block off the entire street with a cop car, you know, with a do 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 just because, like, God forbid, a child, usually it's a child with a parent at this point, um, should be expected to cross the street without a crossing guard. I mean, it's just become taboo. And so, so when I say I'm not against helicopter parents, the whole idea is that this entire culture has changed. I mean, like, if you wanted to say, like, I think a 10 year old could be the crossing guard here. We'll give him a sash, you know, maybe we'll give him a, a sign, you know, it says stop. Yes. Nobody would even allow that anymore. So even if you want to be the most free range, you go to it. I trust you kids, you know, uh, don't come in. I'm locking the door. I got to get some work done. Uh, you can't even be that parent anymore because the culture has become so concerned a about the, you know, the kidnapping and the white van. But then the other fear is that your kids are going to fall behind. You know, it's like they're either going to get kidnapped, raped, and eaten, or not get into Harvard. And either way, that means that what you really should be doing is spending all your time or having an adult spend all, you know, all the kids' free time should be supervised so that they're safe and also so that they're enriched up the wazoo, you know, with, with lessons and with um, tutoring and with uh, reading logs and just all these things that we desperately hope will give our kids the tools to succeed in what seems like a very, you know, understandably competitive um, world. And so the, the childhood that you and I had has almost evaporated because the idea of you being a five-year-old on your bike in a field with other kids batting down the, you know, the wheat so that there's, there's paths through there. That sounds like something out of a nature documentary. You oh, know? Yes. That sounds like public television is going to follow you and say, this is what children did in the 1972. You know, it's just, it's, it's gone. It is gone. And what's interesting, you, you talking about parents wanting their kids, you know, to be in college accepted by the time they're in preschool there was a case in new york city where a mom <laughs> sued her preschool her child's preschool her child was four and the child had to spend some of the time playing with two-year-olds it's like how is that going to help her you know like this was going to keep the kid back and she said i expect her to go to an ivy league school and you're having her talk with you know play with two-year-olds and the mom the mom understood obviously nothing about play and it's really great to play right. in mixed ages but she really was thinking harvard at four Absolutely. I mean, that, that's just crazy, is it not? Now, to me, that seems to say more about the parent <laughs> than the child. So are parents simply looking about how their children are going to reflect on them? Oh, no, no, no. That's why I don't think so. I mean, like I said, I don't think you could find two five-year-olds who were allowed to go and play in a field um, anywhere <laughs> uh, <laughs> these days. And And the fact is that there's so many pressures against parents. It's not that they want this trophy child. 
It's that, first of all, if you want your kid to go outside and play and there's no other kids outside for them to play with because everybody's in soccer or everybody's on their devices or everybody's in Kumon, you, you can't even be that parent. Secondly, and this is, I don't think a giant pressure. And, and I think, and I also feel a little guilty because I think I brought this to public attention, but sometimes because we are in such a, uh, an alert uh, sort of parent shaming moment, if you do let your kid play outside, say you let your five-year-old and your seven-year-old walk to school, there's a slight possibility that someone's going to see him and think that's very young to be walking to school, you know, and call child protective services or the cops. And so there's some, you know, you, you want to know that you're not going to be considered neglectful simply for giving your kids some independence. But that is a bit of a pressure on parents. That's why one of the things Let Grow is doing is trying to make the laws very clear that simply giving your kids some independence or say you work late and you need your kid to come up with a latchkey, that's not neglect. So we're trying to pass those laws. Utah passed that law. A couple other states are considering similar laws. And that's not because a parent wants the best kid and they get to you know, show them off like a trophy. It's because they don't want to be arrested. They want their kids to have somebody to play with. There's nobody outside for them to play with. Sometimes a school um, won't let kids self-dismiss is the new word. And so there has to be a parent or an adult who picks them up. There was a... The, something that got my goat, many things do. <laughs> Lucky I've got a lot of goats. Um, in Kentucky, they pa a woman had written to me that her kid's school would not let the child who was in fifth grade off the bus unless there was an adult to walk him home waiting there. And um, they said, it was like basically three strikes and you're out. So one time the grandfather who was the one in charge of picking him up from the bus stop was in the bathroom and he missed the, you know, the exact moment mm -hmm. of the drop off. And one moment, one time the, the grandfather thought the kid was staying late at school and the kid came home. And so the grandfather missed that drop off. And now the mother was terrified three misses and child protective services would come and investigate her. And so that's not a mom saying, I want my kid to be the best. That's right. a mom saying, I don't want to be investigated, you know, simply because I'm not with the kid every second. So you have a whole culture that is trying to convince parents that, and sometimes insisting that parents not leave their kids. There, there are dance classes and soccer leagues where you're not allowed to leave, even though the kid is there because the, the, the soccer league doesn't want to be sued. They don't want to have to deal with, right. an, you know, an annoying kid. So the, the fabric of society has been rewoven such that, such that, that's such a millennial thing to say. They're all saying such <laughs> that. Um, so that um, parent, there's always an adult supervising a kid. And, and I don't blame parents. I think parents are driven crazy by this. Say you have three kids. How can you possibly be at three soccer games at once? So let's talk about another aspect of this then to, into you know, today's culture. Technology seems to also be making some helicoptering features of our lives worse uh, and more intrusive, uh, giving us the ability to monitor even more. So what do, what do you think about some of those gadgets and things that are, are Yeah, it's, it's, it's such, a, uh, such a pixel of worms that we're talking about. There's, there's so much, you're right, that technology allows us to do. And did you read the Harry Potter books or any of them? I don't know. If oh, you yes. Them. Yeah, <laughs> yes. me too. Oh, yeah. I really like them. I know you have kids. Um, so you'll remember that one amazing magical thing that Harry finds, probably with Ron, is the Marauder's Map. And they unfurl it. And the amazing thing is that when you look at this map, you can see where different people are at any different time. You can see Professor Snape is here and Dumbledore is here. And it is, it's, this, uh, it's this amazing tool. Nobody else has it. It's magic. And now, look it. I've got it right here, right? I can yes. see exactly where my kids are anytime. And, um, and uh, you know, furthermore, you're just asking about the, the role of technology and sort of surveillance of kids. I can see, you know, if I choose to, um, who they've texted, what they've texted, which websites they've visited, how long they spent, what their grades are, how they did on the most recent test. In some schools, you can see what did the ch children choose for lunch? Did they take the apple or the piece of cake? Answer, mm. the piece of cake. Um, or if they took the <laughs> apple, they traded it for a piece of cake. I swear to you, that's what happened, but you don't know. Um, and so you are privy to, privy, private, right? Yes. You somehow have all this private information and it's, you know, when it's, 
uh, presented to parents, it's presented as, well, don't you want to have peace of mind? Don't you want the peace of mind of knowing that your child got to school? And I'm like, my mom had the peace of mind that I got to school every day when I walked and passed the crossing guard, who was a 10 year old, um, without needing a ping, you know, your daughter has safely arrived. Your daughter has entered the first door. Your daughter has entered the second door. Your daughter is stopping at the water fountain. And so I feel like the technology that's giving us peace of mind is really doing the opposite and sowing the seeds of fear that like, did she get to school? How come I haven't heard? And God forbid the kid's battery dies or they leave the thing in the, in the locker or they trade phones with another kid just for fun. Your heart is in your mouth the whole time. And in a way it's driving parents crazy. But I think it's also driving, I don't know if it's driving children crazy, but it is changing childhood because when you were out in the field, your mom knew that you were outside and that you'd come home probably for dinner. But you didn't have the, the same feeling as like, you know, parents say, I just want to know where they are. That way I can give my kids freedom. And it's like, well, you know, when, when we release prisoners on work release, <laughs> there's this ankle bracelet that we put on them and, you know, the, it can't come off and they are all, they're, they're, their whereabouts are tracked and that's not freedom. And when kids grow up thinking that their parents don't trust them to do anything on their own, you know, like, I love you, honey, but I don't trust you, or I don't think you can handle that, or I, I trust you, but I don't trust you in the world. Well, that's not trusting them. It's a different feeling. It's, 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 a, it's an umbilical cord that just hasn't gotten cut. And I think it's driving both generations a little crazy. I think it's making young kids anxious and depressed. And I think it's making parents very nervous about the fact that if anything bad happens, there's, there's no way they can say, I didn't know what was going on, or it was fate, because you could have known. Why weren't you watching closer? Right. And you know, that is an interesting point, because that does that does give other people something else to judge us by. I hadn't even thought about that aspect of it, Lenore. Um, I thought about the fact that uh, my my brothers, I have two older brothers, and um, they like to sneak ding-dongs into the freezer. And they... Um, <laughs> You're making me like hungry to, right now. Yeah. I totally well, they, agree they also frozen. used to eat frozen yeah. Susie Q's, frozen ding yeah yeah they they also used to uh make uh butter and sugar sandwiches when mom wasn't home yes that was one of their favorite uh things but now you can check the caloric intake <laughs> of your child and tell them to go run another round or you know those type things that are on these on these devices and it really I really had to, that made me really think. One of my uh, team members was saying, oh yeah, and you know, if your kid doesn't answer the phone when you call, you can turn the microphone on on their phone now and say, hey. Right, I mean, you know, you've heard of what's happening in China, right? There's this something called the social credit, um, which is run by the government. And what they're trying to do is control the population. What do you think? And, and so social credit is um, works this way. If I go and buy a package of cigarettes, my credit card is in my phone, as is my social credit score. So the social credit thingy knows that I'm buying cigarettes. That's bad. My social credit goes down. What if I go to the liquor store? It goes down again. So if I'm talking to you and you wrote, um, you know, you're a known dissident, my score goes down. And in fact, if I'm talking to my brother and my brother is friends with you, his score goes down and my score goes down. So eventually we don't talk to you at all because if I want my score to be high enough so that my kids go to a good uh -huh. school or that I'm allowed a visa to visit, you know, Berlin or something, I can't have a low score. And so this is a way of keeping track of everything that the population does from what they're reading to what they're eating, to what they're seeing, to who they're talking to, to what they're saying. You know, of course the, the texts can be scanned and the photos I saw, I saw a photo of you and, and, you know, Nelda. Um, so it, 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 it's a brilliant way to completely repress the society because anything they do that to, to be a little bit dissident is immediately, um, you know, they become a pariah because nobody else wants their life to be worse just for associating with you. So we don't have the government doing that here in America, but the the burden of living under this kind of surveillance where mom knows that I bought the ho-ho or maybe I bought a box of ho-hos. Where are they? Well, I must be hiding them. And if I ate them, then that must be, you know, 800 calories each and she can check my Fitbit and I didn't do that much running or walking today. It's almost like the, the parent can be the government to the kid in that there's this ability to, 
to watch and judge and um, recalibrate the kids' behavior. And, you know, parents are in charge of, you know, making sure that their kids have some healthy food and some downtime and love oh, yeah. and responsibility. But the idea of down to the grade of each quiz, down to each mouthful that I know she got oh, the yes. cake, it's, I, I mean, who wants to be that way? I'm happy I'm not living in China. But if I was a kid, um, without even knowing that there's an alternative to be growing up, knowing that your parents know everything you're seeing and doing, and you can't be subversive at all, means you can't really be you. You can only be like a good, a, you know, a good soldier in a way. Well, and self-regulation does not take place. It's, I mean, it would not, right? Because that's such an important part of who we are is, is learning to self-regulate, you know, and, and that is an important um, uh, you know, we do, we do train our children from the outside. You know, we have these influences when they're very young, but then, then we have to start pulling back because they need to learn self-regulation and a society without self-regulation is a dangerous society. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. How are you self-regulating if somebody is always regulating you? Right. It, it, if everything comes from the outside, there's no internal regulation that's going to take place. So let's, let's talk about then the, the sort of the, um, the term that you that you have is just free range parenting. Let's talk about that. What is free range parenting then? Free range parenting, which we now call let grow parenting, is um, a trust that kids can handle some things uh, safely or successfully on their own, and that without any kind of independence, what you were just saying, the self regulation doesn't get a chance to kick in the curiosity doesn't get a chance to kick in and the development of um you know just sort of the resilience one of the things that when we were talking earlier about um helicopter parenting one of the reasons that parents um sometimes feel like they should always be around is I, i'm going to tell you my favorite story and if you've read any stories about me you probably read this one which is that there it was a parents magazine article a couple of years back about play dates as if play dates are so hard you need a whole magazine devoted to telling you how to run one <laughs> and um the question there were so many um interesting questions in this including can you let your daughter go on an overnight to another kid's house like for a sleepover if the divorced dad is the only one home? And the answer was no, which I also find um, reprehensible. But um, because it just assumes that any male who isn't like held down by a wife is going to go and molest the kids. It just struck me as such a, um, a, a deviant way to look at life as opposed Absolutely. to teach your kids, you know, what to say no to and, you know, that they're allowed to say no and, and then give them power to go forth. But that's not even the, the, the one I wanted to talk about. The, the question that I feel is like so emblematic of our society was a mom asks, my daughter's old enough to stay home alone um, for you know brief times when I go out on an errand, uh, but now she has a play date over. Can I still let her stay in, with her play date while I go to the dry cleaner? And Parents Magazine said, no, 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 um, no way. Uh, first of all, the kids could get hurt. And then they gave an example of some kid who got scalded by some macaroni, which, you know, you're a reporter, you got to go find some horrible story. That was the story they found. And then they said, but what if there's a spat? You want to be able to intervene before anyone's feelings get too hurt. And to me, that's the Rosetta Stone of the way that parents have been told to raise their kids now, which is that if your kid is unhappy or has an argument or instead of letting them work their way through it, which I think develops this muscle of self-reliance, of resilience, of figuring out how to deal with people. You're there as like the concierge to make sure that everybody's very happy and let's you know separate and you can each have a low calorie ice cream and, and you can do your jumping jacks. And so um, if you're wondering what parents are being told like how parents are being told to look at their children today, they're being told to look at them as if they are easily hurt and that any hurt is traumatic and permanent because otherwise, so what if they have an argument? You know, they're going to be back to playing with each other tomorrow, or if not, in a week, they're going to miss each other and they're going to have to feel, figure out how to become friends again. Or maybe it was an argument because one of them really is a jerk and maybe it's time to say goodbye to that relationship. But instead, the assumption is that no one should get hurt because nobody can handle that. Nobody can handle an argument. Nobody can handle a betrayal. When in fact, 
children have always dealt with these things, you know, being left out or getting lost or um, being scared or being frustrated or how come nobody's listening to me? Well, maybe because you're not playing nicely enough and you better figure out how to get people over to your side. So when none of that is allowed to develop because there's always an adult intervening, then you get kids who are more easily hurt, a little hypersensitive. Um, the, the statistics show that childhood anxiety and depression are going up, 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 even as their freedom goes down, 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 down. And so Let Grow is trying to make sure that independence is not just an afterthought, is not just an also ran in childhood, but that it is a core part of childhood that people have to start giving back to kids because just like you were talking those those happy memories from the beginning, I think they were happy of you in yes. the field. Oh yes. Mm -hmm. We we can't keep taking that away from kids and assume that they're going to be fine. Just like we can't take, you know, vitamin D out of their lives, and we can't take, uh, you know, we can't take important building blocks of character and resilience out of their lives the way we've been doing when we've taken out their independence. So we are dedicated to giving independence back to kids and making it normal again so parents don't feel like they're crazy to do this. So let's talk about, I want to I want to go back to, to let grow, but let's talk about for just a half a second, how, how we're going to give this kind of independence to this pandemic, if we can for a moment. I mean, because I know it has its own fears that people have, right? And, and some of them are legitimate. So totally, yeah. I, I but would never at the same time, COVID, right, right. But at the same time, um, we do need resilience in our children. We do need the ability, and and other, you know, honestly, other generations have moved through uh, different kinds of illnesses, pandemics like this. I mean, uh, my with my mother it was polio. With her, her younger brother had polio, and so they were quarantined. So oh wow, so they we, had polio. Her her brother did. Mm -hmm. Wow. And how, so they were how, quarantined. How did he end up? Uh, he has post polio now. He's, you know, he's in his, uh, probably in his eighties. Uh, but he, but he, uh, you know, he did have to go through that. And I know that for her, if I were to talk about her resilience as a kid, she was in first grade. There was no anyone Vaccine. bringing homework to her. Oh, oh, right. Yeah. That was, you know, that was like, you know what I'm saying? It's like the culture was very different then, but she, uh, so she learned to entertain him through cutting paper dolls out of newspapers and and doing all these different things right so her she remembers and that's my mother uh uh you, as a hobby was an amazing seamstress but a lot of it came because she was able to cut things out when she was in first grade uh that were incredible just to entertain her brother while he was suffering through polio um and so what 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 tools, what do parents need to think about during this pandemic about still continuing to give their kids freedom? Well, it's interesting. Um, first of all, I think that example is perfect for what we're about to talk about, which is when um, the going gets tough, kids rise to the occasion. And it's once again, something that we haven't had them doing because we've always thought that we had to help them so much and be there and assist them. What's interesting about uh, the pandemic and certainly the school closures is that suddenly kids had so much more free, unstructured time than they had had probably since they were born. I mean, I had a friend who was taking his two-year-old to, it wasn't a gymboree class, it was something like that. And there would be like assistants who would teach the children to tumble and they would tumble them for them. It's like, like you don't think these kids are ever going to learn to, you know, to tumble or to, you know, to roll down a hill without some, you know, board certified tumbling expert helping them at age two. And, and what was interesting is that even at that gym, you weren't, there was free time for the kids. It'd be an hour free time, but you couldn't get it unless you signed up for one of these classes. So from the earliest age, kids have had somebody in their lives always assisting, helping, as if nothing would develop naturally. Suddenly along comes COVID. And what happens? If you're like me, you're on your computer, you're a grown up, you're stuck on your computer all day long instead of going to the office, or you're worried about losing your job, or you're an essential worker, either way, or you did lose your job, you don't have the wherewithal, nobody does, to structure your kids more in day from, you know, 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. with classes and reading and games and toys and um, stories. And so what we found, and we did this giant survey of 1,600 kids and 1,600 parents, asking them, um, what are your kids doing now? And everybody said they're doing something new. 
and the kids did, were doing things that are new because first of all, the old things weren't available to do. And secondly, boredom is so painful that eventually they would, like your mother, start cutting out, you know, paper dolls. We heard from kids like doing origami, sort of similar ideas, tons and tons of baking. There were more pancakes, I would wager, that were made in the last three months than in the last 30 years in people's homes. Kids, the bicycle, one friend took a picture, not a friend, he's a, a teacher down in South Carolina where they believe in Let Grow and he was doing Let Grow Project at his school. And he took a picture of the Walmart in Clemson, South Carolina, where there were no children's bikes left in the bike department because suddenly everybody thought like, wheels, freedom, great. And I... I've watched it, I'm, I'm gesturing like you can't see, but here's my window and outside my window, I was watching a dad teaching his daughter who looked like she was 15 or 16 years old, you know, not how to drive the car, but how to ride a bike. And wow. so it's been this astonishing flourishing of independence, which is sort of the exact opposite of what you might expect. You know, now the kids are home and they're with their parents 24 hours. They're not with their parents 24 hours. Their parents are very happy now to say, okay, go out there. You must have seen this in your neighborhood, drawings of chalk. I just posted one on Twitter yesterday, chalk drawings from the kids outside. I mean, it's, it's like 1952 out there, yes. mi minus the yes. polio, but plus the COVID. <laughs> and, and so I think that this has been an amazing revelation for the parents, you know, to see, I, we asked in our survey, you know, what are you, what are you feeling about your kids? You know, disheartened, worried, proud, happy, excited, whatever. And number one was proud and then confident. And I can't remember, but there were all these fantastic adjectives out of the 10, the five good ones were the five top ones and the five bad ones were the bottom ones because parents were saying, my kids are helping more around the house because there's time, there's time, yes. you know, if you don't, if you don't, dust perfectly or if you're a dawdler it doesn't matter you got all day <laughs> you know you want to <laughs> take all day to vacuum one room go ahead because there's nothing else for you to do so for us it's been almost um what is it a, a something proof you know like the qed we said the kids could do more we thought the kids were going to be okay hopping on their bikes going outside drawing making dinner making cupcakes, making breakfast, and they are. And, and I can tell you, I'll just tell you my very favorite quick story. May I? Yes, I'm pleased. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I was interviewing a bunch of moms um, just to find out what's going on in America. And one of them told me that her seven-year-old first grader, uh, before COVID, this was the morning, you know, get up, Sydney, Sydney, get up. Uh, Sydney, oh my God, you're still not up. It's 7.05, get up, get up. No, 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 get up, oh my God, we have no time. Come on, get out of here. You know, and then Sydney would finally put on her clothes. And meantime, the mother frantically is pouring the cereal into the bowl and pouring the milk. And like, here, here's your spoon. You know, okay, let's get in the car. We gotta go. We're gonna be at the back of the pickup line, drop off line. And off they would go because there was so little wiggle room, right? If you didn't get out at 7.27, you'd be at the back of the line. The kid would be late I'd be late to work so it was just it was a frantic and and miserable and adult completely adult directed morning with this lump that finally you know taciturnly got out of bed and and allowed itself to be dropped off at school like a package but then along comes COVID and now I don't know how long it took but I was interviewing the mom about a month in and now the mom sleeps in and the girl gets up and why not? There's no school. You might as well get up. It's not a miserable day anymore. And she gets herself dressed and she goes downstairs and she pours in her cereal, and pours the milk, eats her breakfast. And then some of the time, the mom said, not every time, but some of the time she will get out a little yogurt and a banana and um, then she'll toast the toast and then she'll take it out and she'll butter it for her mom. And, and she's made her mother breakfast instead of the other way around. And the, the reason I love this story is because obviously this girl was capable of doing that all along, right? It's not like somebody Absolutely. gave her toast buttering lessons, you know, it's COVID. Right. First thing you got to learn is this is the button and you're going to press it down. So um, I think I mean, let grow is sort of a metaphor. It's its name. And the reason is that like children are like seeds and seeds need water to grow. And for kids, that water is free time. And they didn't have it. They were stuck in the ground, in the hard ground, not growing, right. being shoved out of bed in the morning, being treated like inert babies 
That's yes. a bad metaphor. And now they're not. So I think it's been a, an amazing time of growth for kids and for parents during COVID. The, the thing about the busyness before is that um, there was no wiggle room, right? Like if your kid wanted to stop and, you know, look at the, the you know, start collecting leaves or something, it's like, no, no, because we got to get to soccer. Or if they wanted to make dinner, it's like, no, I can make it faster. You know, if we don't get dinner done, then you'll never get your homework done. Then you'll never get your reading log done. And so it was really an unforgiving um, schedule in a lot of people's homes. And, you know, kids are slower. Kids will spill. And if you can't afford a second lost, you just couldn't let them even develop the skills so that they wouldn't spill so much or so that they right. could make their own dinner. And so this has really been cracking that nut open so wide. Um, when you talk about the, the peanut butter spreading, uh, one of the schools that did the Let Grow Project, and I have to just explain quickly, that yes. the Let Grow Project, yes. which is free, it's um, a school um, initiative, any school can do it, doesn't cost any money for all the materials. Um, there aren't even that many materials. Basically, it's a homework project that the teachers give the kids to go home and do something on their own. You can make dinner, you can ride your bike, you can go to the store, you can get yourself to the bus stop, just something that you feel ready to do, that your parents agree that you can do because it's for the project. And if everybody's doing a project, the parent doesn't feel like they're the only one. Um, and then they do it, and then that just changes everything. The parents are so proud, the kid becomes proud. But what was I going to tell you about? One of the things of kids making dinner. Oh God, I forgot it. But I can tell you one cool story about a kid who decided to bake an independence cake um, for her project. And she said that walking to the store was terrifying because she'd always been with an adult. And she said that everybody that she looked at looked angry and she thought they were going to snatch her. I mean, cause oh, that's yeah. all you've been told, you know, be careful. It's dangerous out there or whatever. Um, and then she bought all the ingredients and she paid for it with her own money because she, you know, it was her allowance money because she wanted to be independent. Um, and then on her way home, she said, everybody looked different. And, you know, I don't think the whole world changed in the half an hour that it took her to shop for the ingredients. What changed was her. Just this little bit of independence and being out in the world without an adult and realizing like, I belong here too. I can handle it. It's not, it's not so terrible. I've made it to the store. Coming home, she said, was when she wrote a little essay about it, she said it was more pleasant because I was already used to the walk. And that's what we've deprived kids of. And mm -hmm. I know what I wanted to tell you was that in one school that was doing the Let Grow project with seventh graders, pretty old, you know, we're talking 12 and 13 year old yes. kids. Um, the teacher had them write out what, what they were worried about doing that they hadn't done yet, that they might want to try. And there were kids who would say like, um, I've never, you know, I, I'm scared to go into a store alone with, cause I've always been with my mom and they're filled with strangers. So already this is like store as normal place to be has been replaced with like den of thieves, scary place. And there were kids who had uh, kids who wanted to walk the dog, but they were afraid because what if the dog ran into the street or what if I lost control? Everything was seen through this very negative lens of what if I goof up? What if I, what if I'm not good enough? Which is exactly what anxiety is. But there were so many kids and this is the, the peanut butter story 15 minutes later um, is that a bunch of kids had never used a sharp knife. Right. Mm. That's it. Um, how would you not be depressed if you felt like everything was too much for you, was going to hurt you, that only your parents were competent? Actually, one of the kids wrote that. He said when he did finally use a, a sharp knife, he said he felt great because he was finally competent at one of the things his parents could do. You know, if wow. if you think that, yeah, like, I mean, if the, if the, if the basic drive in children, you know, throughout centuries, throughout eternity, perhaps, has been to grow up and be big and be successful and, you know, be able to become part of the world. And that has been thwarted to the point where you start thinking like, I can't do it. Only my parents can. It's too much. It's too dangerous. I might get hurt. Who wouldn't feel depressed? I'd, I'd be depressed. Absolutely. So let's talk your, what you're talking about. You have called future proofing. Our kids, yeah. right? Okay. So in, in future proofing, what are some good examples of that? Well, future proofing is sort of the opposite of the, um, of making kids so stunted that they are feeling depressed or incapable, incompetent, um, babied, um, atrophied. 
And so what do you want in a, in a kid? You want a kid who can deal with some problems and solve them um, well, or not even perfectly, but bounce back and learn from it. Um, Peter Gray, Dr. Peter Gray, who's one of the co-founders of Let Grow, said that children come into the world uh, just like you can learn language, like you come into the world and if, I, if you were a baby in China, you'd learn Chinese. And if you're a baby in America, you'll learn English. And um, so the, the brain is waiting to be wired by all sorts of stimuli. And throughout history, some of that stimuli has been bad stuff, you know, getting burned on the stove, getting hurt by, you know, getting betrayed by a friend, um, not being able to join the group and having to figure out, well, I better start my own group. And so how do you get all those experiences if if somebody is dedicated to always making sure you don't get those experiences don't touch you know everybody has to play together now you're on his team i don't want to play you got to play um i was actually talking to a 10 year old yesterday who um there's a tag along kid and the, i think the kid would learn a big lesson if the children said no you can't play until you start you know stop whining but in fact there's an adult there who says no that child has to be part of the group and there's never a chance for them to organize it on their own. So to future-proof kids, they have to learn how to deal with some fear, some confusion, some betrayals, which means that they have to experience those as well as all the great things. And so- and Some failure, right? Because some parents just don't want them to experience failure. Right, I, I lost, speaking of failure, I lost my favorite artifact, um, which was my son's uh, trophy uh, from a teenage, bowling group, so this is not for three-year-olds, is a teenage bowling group where he came in eighth place, his team eighth place out of nine, and and somehow the, the, the group felt like everybody had to get this trophy. I mean, it wasn't just like <laughs> saying everybody gets a trophy, everybody got a trophy. Here he is in eighth place, and I'm thinking like, you know, talk about a disconnect. You're a teenager. You're ready to see like either I don't play well, maybe I should practice some more, or maybe that's not my thing. Maybe I should go join the debate team instead. But instead you're told, no, 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 you're great. It's like, really? No, you're great. You got your eighth place. Come on. We're ninth. So, so we have to let kids have a little bit of reality in their lives. And some of and reality is doing some things on your own. And so what Let Grow does uh, through the schools is we, and also you can do it you know, on your own and there's all sorts of tips and ideas, et cetera, on our website. But the Let Grow project where kids have to go home and do something on their own is changing the kids like the seventh graders who were afraid to use the knife or to walk the dog. I mean, the teacher texted me, I, 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 if I turn this back on, I could show you her text, said that one of the kids came to her the next year and said thanks to her encouragement and doing all these let grow projects, he'd come off his anxiety medicine. So yeah. that is a kid who is a lot more future proof, right? He's, yes. he's able to deal with the anxiety of life because it is, you know, it's not a perfect world out there. Um, with what he has internally now, having done some things on his own. And so the, I think the Let Grow Project is just a great idea. It wasn't even my idea. It was a sixth grade teacher in Manhattan. So I feel like I can tout it up the wazoo because we don't make money on it. It's just a great idea. The other thing that we don't make money on, this is just a great idea. We don't make money on anything. We're a nonprofit. Um, mm -hmm. Is uh, Peter Gray's idea. Peter Gray, who uh, believes that children learn when they're curious um, and that they need all these experiences to wire their brains, uh, is to have a Let Grow Play Club at the schools or while school isn't there. If kids in your neighborhood are, you know, if you're in a neighborhood where kids are allowed to get together according to whatever your COVID level is and whatever the local government says, um, you have kids play either before or after school or in your neighborhood um, without adult intervention. And so there's an adult there in case somebody breaks their leg or you know, need the EpiPen, but really the kids have to come up with something to do they have to get buy-in. They have to decide their own rules. If they're bored, they change the rules. If, you know, if a kid is a total pain to play with, well, that kid is maybe ostracized for a little while, and then they learn how to become a, um, a less of a pain and more of a socialized human being. And that is future-proofing you because you're learning how to read people, how to compromise, how to explain something, how to vote to change it because it's boring. That's democracy. And without having this basic experience that all animals do, which is figure out how to play with each other, we've taken that other big vitamin out of kids' lives. Because through play, kids learn these very 
intricate social emotional skills sure. that that you can't get from I, I'm filling out my social emotional worksheet. Empathy is when I see someone sad. That empathy is when you're an eight year old and you see the five year old wants to play and you throw the ball gently, right? Because you don't have right. to prove anything with a five year old. So you need mixed stages playing together, learning how to come up with something to do. And so to me, future proof is a kid who has grown up with figuring some stuff out on their own, whether it's, you know, how to, how to chop the vegetables, how to not get burned on the stove, how to get a game of four square or football going. And these are things that we've stopped doing. We've like, let me do that for you. Help, I can help you. And it's not one of our many expressions is always helping kids is hurting them. So yes. we just are trying to make it normal through a play club or through a homework project that says, go do something on your own, that parents have to step back because the school has recommended it and the school has their children's best interests at heart. You know, it's interesting. I have one who loves to create games and I mean, she makes game boards and that is one of her things that she loves to do. But what I've seen her learn through that was that when she made a game board, let's say two years ago, and she would spend hours creating cards and the game took forever. <laughs> <laughs> but what I saw that she learned Monopoly from worked. it. That's so yeah, boring. Yeah. So what I, what I learned is that watched her do was figure out, oh, people are too bored playing this this long. So I need to recreate my game. Right. So the, it's, it's that boredom issue, right? That issue of allowing them to have time enough to do something on their own. And, and to uh, recalibrate, look at what yes. she was taking in so much information. And once again, I mean, this is the, the drive to have fun is what makes us better humans because I want to have fun. You're not having fun playing my game. I really want you to play my game. Okay. You know, it's four, you move four moves ahead for every dice. Yes. Roll. So <laughs> how outrageously brilliant and talk about future proofing. Here's somebody you know, what does a computer do? What does machine learning do? It takes information and it says, okay, this works, or this is what people like. And it goes to another level. Uh, you know, your kid is doing that. Um, that's, that's, that is the future. She's going to be able to figure out in school and at the job, like this isn't working or in a relationship so with that working. You talk about robot skills too. So tell us, um, and we'll use this game as an example. Yeah. What should kids be learning instead of just rote skill? I mean, roteness only teaches us so far. What what, what more do we need? Because it certainly helps with future proofing. Well, the future proof, I mean, I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record myself, which is something that nobody will know. What was a record, mom? What's a record? Oh, it's like a CD. <laughs> What's a CD? Forget it. Um, I'm going to repeat myself. Um, what kids need is stuff outside of the classroom. So some of their time that might have been, you know, you have a, a school day, if you have time before or after school, that isn't um, with somebody telling you what to do. Like there was a, a big fad in England, I think last year, or the year before, which is to get kids blood going. And, you know, it's really good for kids to have exercise, obviously, and even before school is best because um, then they're, you know, they're sort of turned on by the time they get to school. So schools were having kids run a mile. And it's like, okay, that's okay. But, you know, kids can do other things too. You don't have to tell them you need exercise and I'm going to tell you how to get it. How about you come to school and there's jump ropes and there's an old suitcase and there's some traffic cones and a big cardboard box in the, uh, you know, in the gym or in the, whatever you call it, the yard. And, and then the parents just drop them off and leave them. I mean, that is, they're going to figure out what to do with the box. Some kids are going to play a right. jump rope game. And they're, so, so to me, the, you know, asking what they need to learn, it's like what they need to learn, they will learn if they have some free time. And especially, you know, we talk about loose parts. I brought an old suitcase to my kids' preschool, so I'm obsessed by why didn't they like the old suitcase as much as I did. But I think <laughs> that if there's an old suitcase there, somehow it will just automatically turn all these children into little Einsteins because it's, it's, you know, it's sort of a grown-up thing. You could pretend you're going on a trip. You could pretend that you're in the suitcase. You could pretend it's a house. Give them some stuff to play with, especially junk that you don't care if it gets ruined. Um, mm -hmm. Cloth can be a cape. It can be a turban. It can be wings. So just leave stuff out there. And I really would say, you know, th this drive to play is so deep. It's in every animal. And I will tell you the coolest thing I learned about the drive to play. You want to hear? Yes. Okay. What are three things that like all kids do in all cultures? 
I will tell you, they play a, an equivalent of tag, right? Mm -hmm. Right, chasing games. They play hide and go seek. And sometimes it's freeze tag, you know, you find them and you right. touch them after freeze or if they freeze, you can't hit them. And then they, um, they make forts, right? Did you do that? Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. 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 I did it with my sister too. We didn't make really great forts. We made forts, just really lame forts, like a, um, a blanket <laughs> on a bush. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. But it was still fun to go it in worked. there. Oh yeah. Yeah. And playhouse. <laughs> and then you think about, okay, before humans were even human, what did we have to do? Let's see. We had to chase after our food, right? I'd call that right. tag. We had to hide <laughs> so that we wouldn't become food. Safety. Mm -hmm. I'd call that hide and go seek. And then we had to seek shelter, which is making a fort. So the drive to play has always been there because it's taught us the lessons we needed to survive. I mean, back from when we were monkeys, you needed to survive. Right. And, mm -hmm. and all the other animals do it too. Gazelles chase each other, like almost from the minute they're born. And they're putting themselves in danger because they're out there in, instead of just sitting by mom like this. But it's because Mother Nature put this drive to play into all animals, all young animals, so that they will learn the skills that they absolutely need to, to make it to adulthood. It is so much more important that they play than it's, it's, it's safer for them to play out in the open and be, you know, there where the lions see than to stay safe at home for the long-term success of that kid and that species. So we have to give them this freedom. And, and you're asking, what, what can we be giving kids? I, I'd say it's not necessarily more work, worksheets. I'd say less homework is good. Give them some free time. Even if, even if it's one afternoon a week that they're not in piano or Kumon or lacrosse, some, some like one of our ideas was maybe keep Friday afternoons for free play and just right. assume they're going to be okay. And then tell yourself that it is tutoring. It is social emotional learning. It is a class. It just happens to be run by themselves and their learning skills that they need. So in what you're seeing, is there hope for this next decade of our parenting? Yeah. First of all, I think COVID is this amazing reset button that we were just talking about before with the kids right. cooking and riding their bikes and parents so sick of them because they haven't been used to them being home 24 hours. It's like, yes, take your bike. I heard from one mom who said her daughter, who'd always insisted on being driven to her play dates, started riding her bike during COVID because suddenly the kid realized, oh, I can be free <laughs> and stayed out for five hours with friends, which I can imagine is just this great feeling of like bonding with your generation and coming up with something to do and talk about and feeling grown up and getting yourself there and back. So I feel like parents are seeing for the first time because they couldn't put their kids in all these organized adult run activities, just how, how much their kids are capable of. So I think that yes. already there's a lot of hope for this generation. And then I think getting the message out that um, there's, there's something has been lacking. It's sort of like you know, people didn't used to eat whole wheat bread until it suddenly became like, well, you know what? Actually, putting the wheat back in is good for us. You know, that, that yes. stuff that you threw away, that chaff, that kind of brown and chewy stuff, that turns out to be good. I think that that's what people are seeing about what we're talking about. The freedom, the responsibility, the um, unstructured time, the loose parts, free play. I think people are, I, I, you know, you're, you're talking to me. Why? Because yes. people are hearing a little bit about this idea that is, old-fashioned and yet new, which is giving them a Nelda childhood, really. Let's call yes. it what it is. Yes. Well, Lenore, you have followed your bliss, it appears to me, that you took you took something, right, that could have been called the world's or the nation's worst mom, right? And you and you and you certainly took took that uh into what appears to me when I see you to be your bliss of of continuing to teach parents. Um thank you by the way, oh, for that. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, and by the way, it's not always bliss. <laughs> you know, this part's <laughs> bliss. I love talking to people. <laughs> I hate writing those grants. Oh my God, that's what I have to do when I hang up here. Well, thank you so much for being here. Uh, where can people find you, Lenore? Where can they find you? Oh, it's pretty easy. It's letgrow.org. And that's L-E-T-G-R-O-W. It's not let's grow, it's not let's go. It's not let them grow or let it grow, which always sort of freaks me out. It is simply let grow. And at Let Grow, they can sign up, actually, if they want to find other parents, right? 
you can find other parents, you can find all sorts of printables, ideas, do-it-yourself projects, cute posters, like instead of saying, you know, like alternatives to instead of always saying, be careful, it's like you can do it. So it's, it's sort of a cheerleading place, but it also has very practical advice and it has everybody else. The, the easier way to find everybody else to chat back and forth is on Facebook, there's Let Grow. And there's also, even though I don't blame helicopter parents, there's something because for SEO reasons, we call um, no more helicopter parenting. And you can join there and just say like, Anybody, you know, what's anybody in St. Louis doing? Or I can't get my seven-year-old off the couch. So it's just a way to, to, to find others and sort of sometimes to vent and to share ideas. That's great. What a wonderful resource. Well, thank you so much for being with Nelda Live. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Nelda. Thanks for being out there. Appreciate the time.